Well, good morning. It is great to be with you this morning, and I'm a little, I'm a little taken aback. Turn and look at Berkeley as she's leaving the room, because look at Ava. Look at that head of hair since we last saw her. It's like it just sprung up overnight. I don't know if I can go on. <laughs> Anyhow, um, this morning we find Jesus hitting the disciples and the crowd with some harsh truth, with some things that they're going to struggle to understand. And Jesus, in fact, is going to turn them upside down as he explains to them how it's going to be. Um, as I said last week in the season of Lent, we are going to start each uh, time in God's Word with a psalm, and uh, then we will move into our gospel lesson. So let's pray, and then we'll start in with our psalm. Lord God, open our hearts and minds to this, your word, that we might hear the message you have for us this day. We thank you that we can gather in this place to worship you. We thank you for your presence in this place. May we recognize that presence, and may just one word of mine be yours. It is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to the 22nd Psalm, not the 23rd Psalm, the 22nd Psalm, and we will read uh, verses 23 through 31. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And the, all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who, not, who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. And then we'll jump over to Mark, the 8th chapter, verses 31 through 38. And there are kind of two things going on here. The first, uh, the first section, uh, Jesus is talking about himself, and then he will shift gears and talk about the disciples and his followers as well. Listen now for God's word. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to live their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever had something in your mind that you could just see it so clearly, that you were so locked in, that you just knew how it was going to work out, that you just, just knew that this was how it was going to work out? Maybe 
Or maybe you just hoped beyond hope that it would go even better than you expected. Maybe as a little girl, you had a picture of your wedding day in your mind. Or as a young boy, you just knew that you were going to be the Cowboys, the Dallas Cowboys quarterback when you grew up, right? We all had these dreams. We all had these plans. We all had these understandings or, or, or thoughts of how we thought life was going to go. And for most of us, these, these dreams sadly fade, or maybe a more realistic dream replaces them. For some that might be less fortunate uh, in life, tragedy or hardship might wrestle them from our grasp. The disciples, when we find them in this moment, had to be floating. They were going through their days with Jesus. They were famous. They were almost, you know, his entourage as they traveled from city to city watching him teach and preach and doing amazing things. Um, Sure, it was hard for them to be away from home, to leave home, to go and travel with Jesus, but when they walked into an open-air market, people knew who they were. I'm sure they even pointed and whispered as they made their way into town. What they said had weight. They had seen miracles. They had heard him teach to thousands. They had seen it all. And there was something special about this Jesus. They just knew that he was the one. And they, he had called them by name. And here they were going with him. And things couldn't be better. They were all in. They weren't just along for the ride. They had plans. They had signed on to follow this guy, and big things were about to happen. They just knew it. This has to be what was going through their minds. This has to be what they talked about when they were traveling on the road when Jesus was just out of earshot or when he sent them ahead into a town to secure some food or when they were gathering up baskets of leftover bread and fish or when they were trying desperately to count the people in the crowd to get the Sunday morning head count at worship. This is where we find them today. And I want you to imagine them this way, in this moment, when Jesus tells them how it's really going to be for himself and probably for them too. It is nothing like the fairy tale ending or journey they've been working up in their minds. The earthly happy ending and the heavenly one are simply not going to match up, and this is Jesus' message for them today. The first thing that he kind of blasts them with is the Son of Man must be lifted up. What did this mean? You want us to carry you into the next town on your shoulders? What, on our shoulders? What, what, what does this mean? The Son of Man must be lifted up. Well, as he said, it meant that he would be rejected by the leaders and killed. Stop the train. This doesn't add up. This does not make sense. This is not fit for us. And this was the worst thing that Jesus could have possibly said. So Peter tries to take him aside and, and rebuke him. And Mark doesn't tell us exactly what that means. But, he, you know, it probably was a, a harsh conversation or a, a difficult conversation at least. And, and Peter pulled him aside and said, hey, Lord, you, you shouldn't be talking this way. And I kind of like Peter. Uh, he's one of my favorites because I'm a lot like him. Foolish action, big words, then we think, right? We don't, like I said, know exactly what Mark says, but we know that Jesus shuts him right down, and then Jesus calls the people together and the rest of the disciples, and he explains that Peter's thinking is from a worldly perspective, that it's not a heavenly one. And this isn't Peter's fault. It's what we all would have thought had we been there with the disciples. But Jesus doesn't stop there. It's one of those bad infomercials maybe. But wait, there's more. If you act now, we'll give you free shipping and handling and we'll double your order, right? It's one of those moments where uh, the disciples in, in have just heard that Jesus will be, will be killed. And now... While this harsh news is still fresh in their minds, he goes a step further. Jesus not only rebukes Peter, but he shocks them by telling them that the way of the cross may well be their future too. 
Those who will follow him will deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. And if that's not enough, Jesus continues with a more, even more unexpected and totally unforeseen news. To save your life, you must lose it. You may lose your lives for Jesus' sake. This news was contrary to the disciples' expectations, wasn't it? And so difficult to comprehend that Jesus in chapter 9 and, and then later again in, in the Gospel of Mark will repeat this two more times. The second time he spoke of this, they still didn't understand him. But nine, uh, Mark 9.31 tells us they were afraid to ask him. Probably for fear of being rebuked again like Peter was just a short time ago. And the third time, when they were going to Jerusalem, Jesus told them uh, uh, yet a third time of his impending death. This time was even more grim and more graphic. Namely, that he would be condemned, handed to the Gentiles, uh, who will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Not just be killed, but all the graphic details of what would eventually happen. But that he will rise again. This is Mark 10, uh, 33 and 34. Listening to Jesus predict this ending for him must have been the worst three moments in the disciples' journey with him in the Gospel of Mark. It was Jesus' way of helping them to begin to understand, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. But it was a bitter pill for the disciples to swallow. But it was necessary that they understand. Otherwise, they'd miss the whole point of Jesus' ministry, that he came to give his life for the salvation of them and for us. But by our human nature, this doesn't make sense. We want to be strong. We want to be successful. We want to be prosperous. We want to be influential. Um, uh, when, we, when we dreamed as children, and I, I've said this, you know, I've been here 11 years, so I, I've said this before. When I, when I had my dream as a child, I didn't want to be the, the QB of the Dallas Cowboys. I wanted to win the Indianapolis 500. I wanted to be a race car driver, right? And none of us ever have dreams to be something mid, right? None of us ever have dreams to uh, uh, do, go unnoticed and go quietly through our days and, and, and die peacefully in our beds, right? And at the same time, none of us definitely have the, the, the dream to be persecuted for Jesus. I hope that I grow up someday and I am ignored by my friends. I am alienated because of my beliefs. And no, we don't have that, right? That's, that's just not how it goes. But Jesus is not us. He is God's Son, sent from heaven to deliver us. To deliver us from our sin, to deliver us from ourselves, really. And he came not to, he came to serve, not to be served. And he's making this abundantly clear to all, can he, to, to all who can hear here in Mark and who, to all who will read this gospel. His ways are not our ways, yet he invites us to get on board, follow him, and take on his ways. And the disciples may not have heard it, but there was a ray of hope in the midst of this. In verse 31, and in three days rise again. So even from the very first time that he mentions that he will die, he tells them that he will rise again. So we can clearly see that this is not an earthly story, but a heavenly one with a heavenly ending. We will see him through a cloudy and broken earthly will we see him through a cloudy or and broken earthly lens or will we see him as the king of kings and lord of lords As we continue on this journey through Lent we can be assured of a couple of things Are you ready Life is hard and unfair and full of brokenness as a result of sin as followers of Jesus Christ, we are not given 
uh, a magic wand to avoid difficulty, to avoid hardship, to avoid difficult decisions, to avoid the temptations of sin, we will still struggle. And sometimes this world will just downright stink. But the second thing, the truth that we can take from this is this. Jesus is bigger than all of that, and the gift of his life will erase all of that in the end. If you truly believe in Christ and have invited him into your heart and, and, and struggle upon struggle to live for him, it will all be okay in the end. That's what he promises them. That's what he promises us. Jesus tells them this day that this is how it had to be. This is God's plan for redemption. This is the only payment good enough. Nothing we could do, uh, no uh, acts, no gifts, no nothing could pay the price for our sin except for Jesus' death on the cross. This is how it had to be. And this is how it has to be for you and for me. The path to follow Jesus will be full of struggles. I, I, I just I want you to hear that. It will mean losing friends. It, it could mean missing out on the perceived fun of this life. But denying self will also lead to immense blessings. So in this uh, second week of Lent, I invite you to get out of this world and focus on the world of Christ. Don't be shocked when things don't work out exactly as you plan them to, but turn to Christ for your strength. Lean in. We talked last week how Lent didn't need to be a time of guilt and, and, and uh, suffering. It can be a time of preparation and drawing closer to God. And that's what I invite you to do this week, is to think about the ways of this world that we hold on to. And think about the ways of God's world that are right there in front of you that we resist. That we pretend we don't hear, right? That's always a difficult thing in my life when um, I've been active in prayer. And we have the, you know, Chris mentioned the uh, Life Center study Wednesday night. And we'll continue on in our journey through prayer. And even if you weren't there the first, first time, there is space for you at those tables um, I've been asked by a bunch of people, what are we having for dinner Wednesday night? Bake ziti. What a wonderful answer. I know my family's happy with that. Um, so there is ziti for you, and uh, we can come, and we can talk more about our prayer life, and hopefully we can lean in and know that it was exactly as Jesus told, us, told them it was going to be. But it was also exactly as he told them it was going to be and that he rose for the dead, from the dead for you and for me. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you that you completed and continue through the presence of your spirit to complete your plan for redemption in your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to not get caught up in the plans of this world, in the perceived successes of this world, but help us to live for you and help us to seek to discover what that means and what that might mean in, the way, in terms of change in our lives. Help us to be your people in this place. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.